Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Rasmus Kleis Nielsen. Rasmus is director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. His research is focused on the changing role of news and media in our societies. He has written extensively about journalism, digital media, the business of news, political communication, and related topics in a variety of articles. He has also edited volumes and books, including Ground Wars, Personalized Communication and Political Campaigns, and The Power of Platforms. He is also co-author of the annual digital news report of the Reuters Institute. Okay, Rasmus, uh, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. So let me put the first question on screen and read it out. What does protecting media freedom mean to you? I think media freedom involves first the fundamental human right to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds. Uh, also shocking, offensive and disturbing material as well as material that isn't necessarily true. And within the letter of the law, uh, especially protects expression with which each of us individually may disagree. Uh, secondly, I think media freedom involves the institutions, uh, primarily independent news media, whether for profit, non profit, or public service, that enable us to exercise this right as each of us see fit in an informed uh, fashion. And I think the most dangerous threats to this historically have primarily been political power and secondarily corporate self-interest or censorious forces in civil society, often reactionary and sometimes religious. Uh, so protecting media freedom uh, for me means protecting individual expression uh, uh, against these threats, uh, against powerful people who want to decide what each of us can and cannot say, see or read. Um, to protect us against those who might find it lucrative or advantageous for their lobbying strategy to exceed to uh, to politically uh, uh, um, desire limitations to what each of us can and cannot say, uh, and to protect us from censorious groups who are so convinced of their own righteousness that they want to impose their own values on all others. Um, and beyond that, to invest in creating an enabling environment for independent professional journalism and news media that can provide us with information so that we can exercise these rights in an informed fashion. So there's there's both the element of freedom of speech generally, and obviously of freedom of journalists to do their job without undue influence. Um, we know that we're looking at legislation coming up um, to protect media freedom or to enable media freedom, maybe in certain cases even. What should the EU legislators do or do better to protect media freedom? You can't have media freedom uh, without freedom of expression. Uh, so the starting point has to be to protect the fundamental rights of all EU citizens, uh, also those who live under member state governments who show a disregard for these rights and ensure that the attacks on and erosion of these fundamental rights have real tangible consequences for the governments in question. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, I think it's important to think about uh, the funding side of this, uh, of what it would mean to consider the range of different policy options that are available to create a more enabling environment for independent uh, news media and independent professional journalism so that we can help future generations of Europeans have access to even better, more diverse, more inclusive and more equitable news and media than my generation have had. Um, if we believe that matters, uh, we will invest in it. Uh, and if we don't invest in it, we have effectively decided that we don't think it matters. Um, beyond this, I think it's important to think about uh, how policy can help ensure that we live in an intelligible media environment that civil society groups and uh, journalists and individual researchers have the resources and data access to help us continuously understand the media environment we have in different parts of the European Union, uh, how it works also uh, when it works on the basis of large for-profit platforms operated out of the United States or owned by uh, Chinese companies or, or European companies for that matter, others, 
what it means for whom different groups are impacted very differently by this. Women's experience is different from men's, uh, sexual minorities, uh, ethnic and racial minorities, religious minorities. And thus on that basis, um, have a better understanding of what the threats are actually. Uh, and on that basis, be better able to respond accordingly. So that's the aspect, the positive aspect, the, you know, legislators, this is your list of things to do. Let us switch to the other part of any legislation. Obviously, there's always, I would say, um, policymakers like to make policy, as their name indicates. And sometimes they um, tend to do too much policy or to go into areas that might not be as helpful. So what are the pitfalls that EU legislators should avoid when trying to protect the media and our freedoms? Well, um, I mean, I think Europe has a, um, a history than, uh, than better than most, I think, reminds us that uh, the biggest threats to free expression and media freedom have often been political power holders. Um, and not just in those cases where many of us would say that they were clearly ill-intentioned. Uh, of course, we have had very real experience in Europe with uh, authoritarianism and totalitarian ideologies. Um, but also even when uh, power holders are well-intentioned, I think we will look back today on almost all the past political restrictions on speech, whether in the form of uh, licensing of, uh, of printing and periodicals or, or various forms of restrictions uh, on what can and cannot be uh, published as uh, frankly embarrassing at best and damaging at worst from a fundamental rights um, point of view. Um, I think a second thing that really is a very central, uh, I, I think, to um, keep in mind as we think about how a policy can be used to create a, a, a better environment for fundamental rights and our ability as individual citizens to exercise those rights is to always keep in mind that uh, in a European Union uh, of almost half a billion citizens, we live in irreducibly diverse and disputatious societies. And we will often disagree on matters of fact, um, on uh, matters of what's right, what is good, what is bad, and using judgments as to uh, uh, factuality, as to righteousness, as to what is good and what is bad, to regulate expression and media in collectively binding ways through media policy are thus extraordinarily risky. Uh, they're risky from a principled point of view in the sense that there comes a, a very considerable danger of really fundamentally eroding um, the, the rights of other citizens, but it also comes with practical challenges in the sense that um, when we don't agree on what's right for our societies um, and uh, one group imposed their views on others, it'll generate a backlash. Um, and I think there are very few power holders in Europe these days um, who believe that the European Union desperately needs more populist backlash um, against uh, uh, the political class. So um, a third uh, observation is that if we want media policies that work, uh, I think we need to keep this in mind, the credibility dimension, and think about what are media policies that might be based on broad-based public and political support, perhaps sometimes necessitating a lowest common denominator that in, in turn can ensure legitimacy, but also, of course, secondly, not just legitimate and credible, but also effective. Um, and that is where, of course, as a researcher, I would say that uh, media policy, like any other kind of policy, is in part a political question, uh, what do individual citizens and their elected officials uh, believe is right? But they are also uh, questions um, of evidence and analysis. What do we have reason to believe will work? What do we know will in fact work? And in that sense, I think media policy too uh, benefits from evidence and research. And I would encourage uh, policymakers to think about investing in enabling the institutions that can provide such evidence, whether civil society, independent regulators uh, or researchers. So more evidence-based policymaking um, for real, I would say, because we keep on saying that, but <laughs> sometimes wonder if you should add for real for, for it to happen. Um, embracing our diversity as Europeans, but also accepting that it limits um, common denominators in terms of um, concepts like harmful content, for example, which are extremely tricky. Um, 
So, and as you said, maybe enabling, looking more at enabling journalists, enabling civil society so that the right discussions take place and the right people are involved. Um, that leads us to the freestyling moment, uh, which is the soapbox moment. Uh, no question from me. Let's imagine that, um, as you see here on screen, you are talking to Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the president of the European Commission, Roberta Metzola, uh, the president of the European Parliament. You know that there will be a Media Freedom Act coming out. What would be, in a nutshell, your advice to them? Well, I mean, I think the combination of vigilantly protected fundamental rights and robust institutions that enable people to exercise them as each of them see fit on the basis of their own ideals and interests represents some of the best that Europe aspires to. And I think a bright contrast to our very often dark history and sometimes troubling present. And I think it's really central that we recognize that these are rights that have to be continuously protected. And these are institutions that have to be continually supported. Um, and now for well over four years in the European Union, we've had continuous policy debate around the major challenges to European democracy that some of the features of our media space uh, represents, um, but frankly, very little tangible action. Um, and I think we have to say that it's a time now for the European Union uh, to put its money where its mouth is. Um, it's up to individual citizens and their elected officials to decide how they want to do this. Um, as a researcher, I just hope that they will see the uh, importance of independent evidence in informing their decisions and then recognize um, that if we uh, continue to agree that these are very real problems, then we need to take far more tangible and concrete actions to protect fundamental rights and invest in an enabling environment for independent media um, if we are uh, to actually uh, make a difference. Thank you, uh, Professor Nielsen. That was um, a very um, uh, passionate plea. Uh, I hope the ladies uh, will will get access to the podcast, or or at least their staff will draw it to their attention. Um, as I said, a media media freedom act is expected. Um, the usual way of Brussels of looking at any act uh, when it comes out is to make an assessment of. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly usually <laughs> uh, way. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of goodwill uh, coming out of the European Commission, and, and let's hope that goodwill expresses itself in the type of tangible actions that you mentioned, and not just uh, you know more good feel type of legislation. I'm sure we will be in touch once that act comes out, uh, and more discussions will take place on on more concrete language, uh, but certainly thank you very much for your time uh, for this podcast. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks for all your work in this and thanks for the invitation.